hello, my name is Stephen Callahan, and today on the occasion of the presentation of this photographic album by Christopher Fitzsimons, I'm going to interview him about his father, Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Fitzsimons, who served with the Leinster Regiment. So Christopher, uh, can you give me a brief overview about what you remember about your father? Yes, well, I remember quite a lot. And um, but of course, generally people don't talk to their fathers. And looking back, I think I'm like everybody else or most people else that I never asked him what he did before I was born or what he was up to or what countries were he were in because I sort of knew. I had been in India myself at the age of one, two, and he was on military duty with a British regiment called the King's Own from Lancaster there, and he had a wonderful job. He was in, he was the liaison officer between the military and the South Indian Railways. So we travelled a great deal on his business, and we even had a coach on the railway. Uh, this was all in the kind of... Um, bottom part of Italy, where it comes down to a V, okay. below Trichinopoly, and with Madras on one side and Bombay on the other. And we really, I believe, had the run of the railways. And I suppose if he said, I need to go to such and such a place, they would hook on the coach uh, onto the train and would go to wherever his business to do with... The, militarising the railways, was connected. Don't remember any of that at all. I do remember the stories because my grandparents came out to India. He was a surgeon in Belfast. And just about the time my parents were married, he and his wife decided he was going to retire and they were going to join us in India. That's the sort of thing I should have asked about. Did my parents really want her parents to come out to India? I don't know. Anyway, they came. My grandparents came, and there are photographs of me as a tiny child uh, with my grandparents and my, my parents in this beautiful bungalow in Trichinopoly, in a military housing estate. And more recently, my wife and I decided we must go and see what India was like because we have a lot of snapshots. And we went to Trichinopoly and we found where the British had their military headquarters, very handsome 1920s, 30s English type of buildings. And from photographs, we thought perhaps here was where my parents' bungalow was. It might have been that one, but no, because that detail on the door is different. And in the end, we came to the conclusion that theirs had been demolished for an ESB uh, power um, outlet, and most of the others were in ruins, but some had been taken on by the Indian Navy and were inhabited by Indian officers, and we met a very nice lady, a colonel's wife, who said, oh yes, this would have been where your people lived, etc., etc., etc. And that was all fascinating to me, because so much um, connected with the snapshots that we have and the stories. For instance, when we went in our famous train up into the Nilgiri Hills in the summer, um, because it became too hot down in the plains, and we had a bungalow in a place called Utukamund, where all the Brits went. And it was like Colchester or Chichester. Okay. And, but there were monkeys, and monkeys used to get into the train at the stations looking for bananas and things like that. And my mother was horrified to discover a monkey sitting in my cot in the train. And she thought... It could bite and it could be venomous and so on. And she was terrified. And she got my grandfather and he talked nicely to the monkey. And the monkey was got out of my cot. And then um, my, I think my mother nearly swooned. But um, 
My grandfather said in reference to the monkey and myself, which was the monkey? And what, that was the, fam the only family story we brought out was that I was taken for a monkey in India. But when we, my wife and I, got out of the train in the Nilgree Hills at this high station, there were all the monkeys. Okay. It was like a dream. What do you remember about your father's military career? Really very little, because um, when um, I came of an age when I was understanding things, he was in Egypt and India and also in... Um, it wasn't Israel, it was what? Palestine. Palestine, yeah. And they were keeping the peace, imagine, Moya in Palestine. And at that time, at the end of the 1930s, uh, I and my mother and my brother were staying with relatives round Ireland. And this was what one did at that time. And if you want detail of that, um, my memoir is called Eleven Houses. It's published by Penguin. Okay. And uh, it's, it's me... Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, looking back on this period of... It's called Eleven Houses, and uh, you can follow us round our different relatives and also in Northern Ireland, uh, some houses that were supplied by the British Army um, and some guest houses run by the Army and so on like that. Okay. So we were very sort of military. The war is coming on, and my father is coming home, yeah. And my mother is staying with her parents, Dr. and Mrs. Killen in Monaghan. They were Monaghan people, though they worked in Belfast. And uh, they were staying in a lovely country house called Ballylech, in, in Mon just outside Monaghan town. It's still there and beautiful kelp. Okay. It's a big farm. And my grandparents were what was called paying guests. You wouldn't use the term lodgers. They were paying guests in this large farmhouse. And my father came back from uh, Palestine. And here was this man, and he had a mark of ink on his finger. That was the thing I noticed. And I didn't know... I knew, I was, knew he was going to be there, mm. but he meant nothing to me at all. Okay. He was my father, and I had to shake hands with him. Yeah. Now, that is very peculiar, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Uh... So, looking back, my book, Eleven Houses, doesn't really deal with that, though it does say something about it. Sure. But if I went into it more deeply, I would say that in those important years, up to the age of about five or six, I didn't know my father, because I didn't remember him in India. And that is not a good way to start off. And if I were writing a different journal now, uh, I would probably approach it in a different way. Sure. So the answer to that is my father didn't talk about his military career at all. Okay. We hired a house. This would be 1938 or nine. He had long leave because he'd been on service for so long. A house called Mount Louise in Monaghan a very damp, large, but handsome house, and it's still there, and it's now very handsome. And um, I obviously must have been upset because I'd been living with a very nice great-aunt, and that was my home. And I was taken away from her to this damp house where this man was, who was my father, and my mother was there too, and my brother was brought from my grandparents' lodgings at Ballylech. And the story is that when my grandmother and my great-aunt came to visit, it was only a few miles away, there were shouts and screams in the evening when they were leaving that, Granny, Auntie, that our real parents were our grandmother and my aunt. OK. And... I think as, as a child you put that kind of thing away and you forget it. Sure. But since you asked me, um, I'm now dredging up thoughts that I probably buried mm. 
Mm. I may have been much more upset at being taken from my great aunt, who was my mother, I thought, um, than I may appear now. And I think we had a little bit of analysis a few evenings ago with myself and my wife, and I th said, I think that I buried things and didn't want to know. Sure. And this probably affected the way I approached life later, that I kept into myself, didn't talk very much, um, didn't react to things happening, possibly because I was afraid of an outcome that I didn't want. Sure. I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. And you are the first person, apart from my wife, that I've talked to about that. I don't know if that's military history. I don't think it is. But it's, I suppose, reminiscent because your father was born during Queen Victoria's reign. So yes. he was a, a Victorian and his qualities might have been those of the Victorian. So been distant from the family, having his career in the military might have been normal for that generation. And I suppose first-hand accounts aren't too uh, common. So it's interesting to have your perspective about what you remember about him. Yes, well, um, one might wonder why he went to, into the British Army and there was no uh, military background in my paternal grandfather's side. They lived in South County Dublin. They were landed gentry. And my grandmother, my uh, maternal grandmother, uh, was a lady of Scottish descent and she had masses of military in her family in um, a number of different British regiments and it may have been through that side of the family that my father decided that he was going into the British Army at the age of 15 or so 16 or something like that and he went to Sandhurst and it was be the beginning of the First World War yes. and uh, they were one of these Irish families that is very interesting indeed because they lived very well together. They had different ideas, different outlooks, different backgrounds. Um, my grandmother, the, of Scottish descent, um, was a great friend of Constance Markovich. Okay. And uh, she lent the Countess a cottage that she owned nearby uh, where she used to go, the Countess used to go for painting weekends. She was quite a good painter. Do you think she was painting while she was there? She was not. She was training the Fianna. Mm. And my grandmother knew this perfectly well. And I think she lent the house to the Countess. There's no uh, record in the family of her um, charging a rent or anything like that. And my grandfather... Um, of course knew all about this. My grandfather was a justice of the of the peace in the British regime. And despite this, they were... In spite of this. To... And my father was home, I suppose at the age of 15 or 16, from Sandhurst. Would he have been at that age at Sandhurst? Um, maybe 17 or 18. 17, perhaps. Yeah. And they were out for a walk, he and his dad in Sandyford, County Dublin, and they saw men with trucks unloading something at Constance's cottage. And my father said, oh, what's all, the, all that happening at Con's cottage? And my grandfather said, you didn't see that. Okay. And he was a JP. And his son was training to be an officer in the British Army. Yeah, and he was training to be an officer. Yeah, And remarkable. he didn't see that. That is about the only story I know of that kind. And I think it's fraught with interest. Oh, definitely. And the, the, you, if you said divided Irish families, not at all. They were not divided. They each understood the other and looked after each other. And one was fairly Republican, the other was fairly Council Catholic. Yeah, that's um, a very interesting dynamic. Yeah.
And my grandmother used to go to balls at the castle when that happened. Mm. My grandfather didn't because he was very antisocial and didn't like dancing. But she was very sociable indeed. And she um, did things like judge uh, fancy dress competitions at the Gate Theatre. You know, those sort of, that sort yeah. of lady. And he Quite was social. a country gentleman riding, uh, selling cattle, selling horses, things like that. No great brain and I think um, no great understanding of life at all, except for things that it was necessary to understand. And he had enough noose to know when to say, no, um, officer, there was nobody here and we've no ammunition in this house. OK, so he he had his... He did his... He had he, his place. He had his place and he, yeah. he, knew what, he, he knew what was going on. He wasn't stupid, but... Uh, I do know that um, my brother says that my mother um, was not at all impressed by my paternal grandfather because she, she being a northerner, a Presbyterian okay. and instead of her own Catholic yeah. um, she thought he should be doing something not just making a few bob on horses you know yeah. and um, I think it. I think that family life was a bit of a no-no to my mother We've already touched on some of the stories about your father, but do you remember any specific stories that he might have told you about his sort of career in the army or just anything in general about his time in, during the Great War? Not very much. I do remember that when he was in India first, he t related um, years later that they spent some time on the Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean, this regiment, and it was like something in Greek mythology, a um, wonderful tropical island, and there could have been gods and goddesses coming down, and they uh, probably ate lotuses, and they uh, apparently had a very laid-back time swimming in the Indian Ocean. I don't think they had many duties, and he remembered that as a sort of long holiday. Possibly it was only a few weeks, but I remember being fascinated by that and saying I would love to go to the Andaman Islands. But that's really the only story of that period um, that he told us. He didn't tell us about um, uh, keeping the law in Palestine or what work he had to do with the Indian Railways. Yeah. But then I didn't ask. And I, it wasn't that I didn't want to know. It was that I kind of wasn't interested enough. And then when he was dead, of course, both I and my brother were dying to know sure. the whole story. It's interesting as well, and it sort of fits into a general... Uh perception that a lot of the veterans of the Great War just never spoke about their experiences, that it was something that wasn't talked about. And I suppose, in a sense, now that seems to be translated into that the First World War was forgotten, which I suppose it wasn't as such. It was just it, um, that the veterans just never talked about it. Um, it just wasn't a done thing. Um, so that's my very my father was in the First World War in Flanders or northern France, and he was wounded. Um, how he was wounded, we aren't sure. It was something to do with capturing a machine gun nest. Now, that may just be mythology, but he was awarded the Military Cross for that. Yeah, and he was uh, the third highest gallantry award to under the Victoria Cross, so it's a, it's a fairly impressive award. And um, we never asked him the exact details of how he won the MC. Yeah. But he was sent home wounded, and then the war was over. And he was, of course, with the Leinster Regiment. Yeah, and I uh, think he served in France with the 2nd Battalion. 
Yes, he did. What were your father's interests outside of his career in the British Army? Uh, he played polo. He played hockey. Um, I never saw him play polo or hockey. He uh, retired. I think you'd say he was invalided out of the army at the towards the end of the Second World War. Um, we met him at Newcastle in County Down because at that time he was um, assigned to the... Um, now, what regiment was it? It may come to me. For some reason, uh, he had left the King's Own or was in secondment or something like that, and he South Staffordshire Regiment okay. yeah, the South at, Staffs. in Newcastle County Down. My brother and I and my mother were living with relatives in County Monaghan. We went to Newcastle. It was about 1942 or three, and the uh, British Army was there, uh, encamped, and a lot of army wives and children were living in Newcastle. And I and my brother went to a little school. My father lived in the house that we rented, which was a small mews without a bathroom uh, behind a row of houses because uh, housing was very difficult to get. And it was all army wives and um, <laughs> very British. And my mother was a member of the Women's Voluntary Service. And she had a little badge saying WVS with a crown on it. And on Thursdays, they made camouflage netting in the garage of the rectory. And these camouflage nets uh, went out, it was thought, a year later to northern France. And also they did scavenging, which was to find uh, rubbish that could be converted into guns, metal rubbish, old kettles and things like that. And uh, she also did an evening in the forces uh, library. And the soldiers came in and borrowed books. Uh, my father made appearances, uh, was working during the day, came in at night, um, wasn't we weren't quite sure what he did, and then suddenly everything changed. The Brits had gone, the Americans arrived, and they were massing for D-Day, I think nearly a year in advance, I'm not quite sure, you would know the history. And all these Yanks arrived, much better dressed, much better equipped, with jeeps and tanks and all that, all lined up in in Newcastle. And these soldiers would be giving out chewing gum and chocolate bars and everything. Okay. And it was totally different. Um, and that was not going to last. Uh, my mother passed on to Scotland uh, in the wake of my father, who was now with some other regiment, at a place called Bonnie Rig. Why? I don't know. And my brother and I were back to Monaghan to relatives. So that was the way it was all the time. But that was a magical time in Newcastle. There was swimming, there was walking in the mountains, there was the guns going down the street, all the manoeuvring, everything like that, small aeroplanes landing at Ballykindler uh, airfield yeah. um, and uh, on the uh, strand there were things like telegraph poles and those were in case enemy planes landed on the strand there were all these telegraph poles to try and, stop the planes and from... one day a very nice lady who was very very much uh, in charge of the women the women's of the WVS, um, she would be swimming and she saw a seal on a pole and she thought, the poor thing, it's got stranded at the top of this pole. And she got an umbrella and she swam out in a raging storm with this umbrella and poked it off 
the top of the telegraph pole, the poor thing, and then she swam back to the shore. All right. Looked back, and the seal was back on the pole. Those kind of things happened. Yeah. And everyone was standing on the shore applauding while she saved the poor seal. Only for it to go back. <laughs> Last June, myself and my daughter and son-in-law and my wife went to Newcastle and we stayed in the Sleeve Donard Hotel, which was a railway hotel of the 1890s. And at that time, it was where the American forces stayed. Okay. And they had a hoedown for the wives of the British soldiers, those who were left behind. And my mother and some other ladies uh, went to a hoedown with country dancing and the unfortunate soldiers doing this. <laughs> and the colonel referred to my mother as honey, honey, oh. and my mother didn't like that at all. Yeah, I can imagine she didn't take kindly. To... That's the sort of thing that I noticed. But you see, we were children. I would have been seven to eight at that time. What did your father do after his time in the army, after, as you said, he was invalided out? He was invalided out. Uh, he has something difficult with his sinus. Um, apparently, very bad sinus. Okay. I have always wondered how that could be. Surely you could cure sinus. Did something else happen? I don't. My brother says definitely nothing happened. But he went to Derry uh, to uh, a, a hospital to have this dealt with. And fortunately, um, I had a cousin who was a ENT doctor in in he was a surgeon in Derry, and he went there. A uh, relation of my mother's. And he dealt with this sinus problem. And at that time, we stayed in a house that was organized by the military for him called Miltain House in Straban. You'll find that in my memoir. And he stayed in this hospital, and we stayed in Straban in Miltain House. And then, apparently, uh, he was finished with the army. It, he wasn't improved. I have always thought it very odd that he could not go on being uh, a soldier, perhaps with a desk job, you know. Okay. Anyway, he yeah. stopped and he retired. And he got a job as the agent or manager of a very large farm in County Clare called Mount Callum. Uh, where the, there was a family called Tottenham and there were hundreds of cattle and all that. It cannot have been good for them, for my father and my mother. They must have felt very isolated on this mo mountain in County Clare. But I, apparently it was all he could go get from the... Um, job that he got after he left the war. And then he moved to Anna Kerrig in Monaghan. He was made wonderful wood furniture. Yeah. He should have done that sure. instead of trying to run somebody's estate or firm. Yeah. firm you know. He yeah. should have done that. that we have beautiful um, bowls um, lamps, things like that. He should have gone to one of those uh, f furniture places in Dublin where they do... Where they would make them carpentry yeah, you or, know, or working with should wood. should have done that. Didn't. Then looking yeah. after cows and uh, yeah. large estates. Do you remember your father ever mentioning anything about the Leinster Regiment's depot, which would have been uh, Burr Barracks? Yes. Um, he was very upset, I think, uh, when the 
Uh, well, of course, I'm sure he was upset when the regiment finished, just like that. And of all right, he went to the King's Own at Lancaster and India, etc., etc., etc. But I think he had a sort of... He was an Irish person, and I think he wanted to be in an Irish um, regiment. An Irish regiment. And, and from just while the photo album is not annotated very much, the pictures of the depot, he does refer to it as poor old depot uh, after it having been burnt out. So he must have felt some sadness towards He, I think, felt enormous sadness. And he, he visited. And also, when there was a church service uh, not all that long ago uh, in one of the churches in Burr, um, he went to that and he went out by car to Crinkle. Oh, that would have been, was that the unveiling of the Leinster Regiment window in St. Brendan's Church in 1964? It was. Okay, so yes. he was present at that. He was present at that. And that just shows how, for the members of the regiment, the placing of the window in the church was such a That's, big yes. thing for them. And I'm um, uh, um, so sorry that the uh, the window is so high up. It's, you can't really see it when you're down in the church. Yeah, were yeah. you there for the unveiling no. of it? No, none of us went. He went. I suppose he thought possibly no one is interested. But he went along and he went and then he went out to to Crinkle and he looked at the remains and the village was really... Um, At that time, it was very sort of dishevelled. I can imagine. And in 1964, the barracks would have been sold by then for essentially scrap stone. Yes. And most of it would have been demolished. So having potentially last seen it in 1922, after it was burnt, to seeing it been further destruction and yes. decay uh, must have been quite it, uh, Absolutely saddening. awful. Yeah. And... Um, the sort of dissuetude that there was. And these very handsome, he noticed these wonderful arches were there, and then a bit of broken up wall and so on, and then not so well looked after houses nearby, sure. that sort of thing. If he visited now, it would be quite different because something has been done. There's an industrial estate, um, some very handsome factories and some very nice suburbs and a handsome main street. But for him, the barracks has gone. Yeah, for yeah. him, Burr, it was I an mean... awful thing to happen. Um, and I guess that he was obviously very sad when he heard the thing, but this was a, an era of things happening, uh, like the things that happen uh, after the First World War and later. But then sure. another era further on, everything looks even worse. And I thought, he must have thought, what is this coming to? Yeah, it must have really um, opened his eyes. From... They used to make a joke when recruits were coming in that they would hit their head on one of the arches coming in. Did you hear that? No. Yeah, they all used to say, you have to bow your head here, you'll hit it. Do you remember what your father did uh, in later life? Well, yes, of course I did, because by this time I was a teenager and I went to Trinity and I was living in Dublin, going to college, uh, my brother lived in college uh, because he was a medical student and he, he had to be up early in the morning and so on. I didn't have to. I went in on the bus. But he lived at Glen Collin, a very uh, handsome uh, house that belonged to the family, which he bought back. It had been the family home. And uh, uh, round about, I'm very bad on uh, dates, but when I was going to college, he and my mother bought it uh, 
And really, it was um, a huge expenditure for them, and they shouldn't have done it because they didn't have income. Um, he was still only about 55 and uh, should have had money coming in. All they had was a very small pen army pension, and they lived in this very handsome house and looked as if they were very grand because the house was very grand. And my parents and my grandmother joined us. This is the Countess Markovich friend lady, and also my grandfather's sister, who had been in the what would it have been called? A nurse in the F First World War? Uh, the voluntary aid department? A volunt yes, a VAD. Yeah. And she got a job in o Oxford uh, just after the war, and she stayed there with the family as a governess and things like that. And then when my parents bought back the house at Glen Collin, she joined them. So there was these two old ladies and my parents and most of the time my brother and most of the time myself and it was not a one a one it was not a well run house um because there wasn't a lot of money in fact there was very little money at all and i think it was a huge expenditure and very foolish but he liked to be there I think he was very proud that this was a family home of two and a half hundred years old and that Daniel O'Connell uh, had lived there, that um, the uh, Catholic Association that started off on the road to Catholic emancipation uh, had their meetings there and so on and that the it was really, in a way, like a sort of repository of O'Connell Iana with statues and pictures and all sorts of things like that. And this is someone who was an officer in the British Army who yes. had this interest in potentially yes. Irish nationalism. Yes, which shows potentially. Yeah. Uh, but when he referred to the wars, either of the wars, it was always, we did this, we captured a uh, machine gun nest. It was we. It wasn't the British that I was in did. Okay, so he didn't distinguish, he didn't distinguish the, the British Army as a separate identity. It was no. what... No, and there were a lot of people like that. Whereas my generation grew up uh, in the Free State and then what became the Republic. And we, I anyway, felt he shouldn't be like that. <laughs> you know, that was perhaps a bit unkind of me. But um, I was a distinct Republican and we were very mixed because the Fitzsimons were Roman Catholic. The uh, O'Connells, as you might know, <laughs> were Roman Catholic, and my Markovich-type grandmother was Church of Ireland, okay. and my mother's family were Presbyterian, but preferred the Church of Ireland because they liked the liturgy better than the very boring Presbyterian service. So but they were every sort of colour and mixture. Um, and there was this what now seems a very interesting and ordinary development that we are all different shades of Irish, but Definitely. not them, yeah. the English regiment, or them, Irish country gentry at the same time. Sure. And I suppose it, go it goes to show you that Irish history is not black and white. That Definitely it's not. That incredibly complex. No. And you've just sort of illustrated that perfectly with your father being an officer in the British Army, yet not distinguishing it as a separate identity from Ireland, yet he had potentially nationalist <laughs> interest, especially with um, Daniel O'Connell. So, uh, well, really Donald O'Connell wasn't all this that nationalist, um, not in the way that many people might think. He was fairly unionist. In fact, I would say very unionist. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes. And couldn't see 
couldn't see that the Irish language was of any use to anybody. Whereas I do, you see, a generation or two later. When uh, I was growing up, the O'Connells were not terribly well thought of. They were not Republican, my O'Connell relatives. Okay. And um, um, they, O'Connell didn't die for Ireland. Pierce died for Ireland. Wolf Tone died for Ireland. But but O'Connell would have been very happy if Ireland had remained as part of the British Empire. And um, this was not well thought of. And it has only been in the last, I would say, 30 years that O'Connell has come back and all the good things have happened, like the... um, the house, the wonderful national park, the um, the woods, the the islands, the strands, and all the visitors coming, yeah. and it's back again into where it should be. But for it was for an uneasy time after 1916. Um, the O'Connells were not the best thought of. Uh, do you have any other stories that your father might have told you? Well, I do remember my father saying that there was evidently a fire at Burr Castle sometime while he was uh, at the depot in Crinkle, and the military naturally went out to help and brought ladders and water and all that kind of thing, and... Uh, My father, uh, assisted by some soldiers, climbed a ladder and went in a window of a a bedroom out of which there was smoke going and he found jewellery in that bedroom on a dressing table and he put the jewellery in his pocket and climbed down the ladder and said nothing. And the next day he... thought really it was sensible not to say anything, just to say there wasn't jewellery on him and he had better go uh, to Burr Castle and explain that this we found it when we thought that that bedroom was going to go on fire and there was smoke and everything and obviously the lady had disappeared and he gave in the money to somebody like a butler or someone like that, and explained that he had found this jewellery and they were alarmed that it might be lost and they kept it for the uh, Rosses. And they never heard back. They never had a little note saying, thank you very much for saving my jewellery. So thanks very much for talking about your father, Christopher. It's been very interesting to hear what you recall about him and um, I'm sure everyone listening to this will also find it interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, but I wish I could think of more and also that I should be more articulate, but you just about got me in time, I think. Thank you very much again.